Welcome back to another video in my San Diego Bookstore series. Uh, today I'm going to be talking with Jack Ron of the uh, Groundwork Books or Groundwork Book Collective, uh, which is a radical left-wing bookstore on the campus of UCSD. Uh, for those outside the pale of California, that's the University of California at San Diego. Um, which is in La Jolla, which is also incidentally where I uh, took this photo. Uh, you, can see it's a, you can see it's a hideous and dreary place, but uh, someone has to live there. Uh, though apparently that's not me. As is often the case with the interviews in this bookstore series, uh, I expect it will also be uh, of interest to uh, the, uh, the viewers of my, my regular videos, uh, whether or not they have any particular interest in the San Diego bookstore scene. In particular, I was uh, uh, surprised to uh, find that uh, my interviewee is a fan of Kevin Carson and Sean Wilbur, since I've been under the misimpression that this was a fairly strictly Marxist bookstore, and it turns out not quite so strict. Um, anyway, uh, here we go. Hi, Jack. Hello. Hi there, Roderick. See you. Good to see you. Um, yes, I will be the representative for Ground Books Collective today. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is a, um, a bookstore on the uh, campus of uh, UCSD. Uh, is this the right address for you? Ground Work Books, three twenty three UCSD Student Center, ninety five hundred Gilman Drive. Yes, that is correct. Okay, great. <laughs> So Andrew, tell me a little bit about uh, the bookstore, the kind of books you offer, uh, how it's organized, since I know it's organized as a, as a collective, um, uh, the history of the, book, of the store, and your, your history with it or whatever. Right, yeah. So um, Grand Books Collective, as you've just mentioned, we are a um, nonprofit, um, horizontally organized student worker cooperative. So um, a lot of our members are, you know, undergraduates, graduate students at the University of California, San Diego. Um, we have, yeah, like, we strive to have like no hierarchy within the sort of workplace. Um, everyone is very much, you know, equal to one another. No one is like barking orders. There is no sort of like bureaucracy or vertical power structures in the store. Um, let's see. Yeah, um, it is a very, I guess, you know, it, it is a left-wing bookstore. Um, many of our books relate to anarchist and Marxist theory. Um, we have plenty of, right, actually right behind me is a sort of glimpse of the bookstore. There are um, lots of books on like philosophy, um, labor struggle, social activism, that sort of thing. And um, in terms of the history of the store, um, it's, it, is, it is a quite interesting. So we were founded in, I believe, 1973, 1974, in the wake well, of- I would actually have been in San Diego at the time it was found, it was founded, although I would have been a little kid. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so it was founded by many of the new left activists within the UCSD campus. Um, I believe, especially after the wake of like many of the anti-Vietnam War protests, um, some members from that sort of milieu cohort got together and decided to um, create a bookstore. And the name of our bookstore, I believe, comes from the fact that the way it was organized as a like, horizontal worker cooperative was supposed to be sort of lay the groundwork of a new society of a more anti-capitalist, post-capitalist sort of uh, way of organizing the economy, way of organizing society, that sort of thing. 
And you since then, assuming that I, it's based on Kant. I'm sorry, what was that? You ever get people assuming it's based on Kant's groundwork? Um, yes, we've had a few people joke about, uh, yes, uh, groundworks of the metaphysics of ethics and Kant. We could, yes, jokes about us being a Kantian bookstore, that sort of thing has emerged. Um, but yeah, for the most part, it is just, uh, you know, contemporary left wing politics or the uh, sort of bedrock of the store. Um, so yes, it was founded in the 70s. And then since then, Grand Books Collective has sort of had, um, aside from trying to organize ourselves into an effective worker cooperative, we've also been, um, you know, very involved with many, many, many activist projects throughout the years. I know um, in the past, I don't have any strict details about like the 70s, 80s, 90s. I know we've had members of the bookstore participate in, you know, anti-tuition um, or anti-tuition increase protests, um, anti-apartheid protests. Um, let's see, like support for Palestinian justice, that sort of thing. Um, yeah, that, I think that briefly covers sort of a, it's a quick history and overview of, a, of the bookstore, of the collective. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, you hold events in the store? Um, yes, yeah, so uh, prior to uh, the COVID-19 um, epidemic, we did host, um, uh, there's been various events hosted on and off throughout the years. I know we've, uh, before, this was before I um, arrived at the bookstore. I know we used to hold like free, um, I think it was like vegan brunches every Saturday. That's sort of fallen towards the wayside. Um, we, let's see, oh, some of our biggest events were usually like movie nights. So we'd host like free screenings of, you know, whatever movies the collective decided we wanted to show that week and just host it free for the public. Um, I know we've hosted a number of reading groups uh, as a bookstore after all um, at our collective and just invite people to sort of um, join us in reading discussions over whatever book we choose. Usually it was some sort of something from uh, literature or like political theory, that sort of thing. And um, when, again, when we were in person on campus, um, we would usually host um, at least once a quarter at our school, try to host a general body meeting where we just invite people to um, come learn about the collective, come check out the collective. We usually have presentation showing off um, basically the details I'm explaining here about what the collective is and why, um, you know, and if, and if anybody was interested, they would be able to volunteer at these events. Um, yeah, that's some of the more recent notable things we've posted at our bookstore. So how soon do you think that, do you think that uh, you'll be open like in, for in-person stuff in the fall? Does it look like that's going to happen? Um, so this past year, because of various, um, you know, COVID-19 related things, we were, we were open, but we had very limited capacity, very limited um, staffing hours. Um, you know, it was a very strictly like you come in, you browse around for a bit, you buy a book, no, you know, that sort of thing, no sort of sitting around, no, you know, long term, no in-person events. Um, right now, the university has told us as of this, at the moment of this recording, I guess, um, there should be in-person events and um, I, I'm a little foggy on the details. Everything's still a little bit up in the air right now because of the, you know, Delta variant cases are increasing. Hopefully there will be, um, if everything goes well and, you know, the majority of the student body is like vaccinated and all that stuff, we should be able to host, um, you know, in-person events, probably return to some of the previous functions we were doing prior to the pandemic. But um, yeah, nothing, I guess nothing is quite set in stone right now. So how did you personally get interested in this bookstore? So I, when I was in high school, I was very interested in a lot of left-wing politics. Um, you know, I've been familiar with the cooperative movement. I thought that was very, you know, this, at least reading about it, like in my area, there weren't any cooperatives nearby, but like reading about it, I was very enamored with this idea of like, oh, um, workplaces, there are workplaces out there that have just completely done away with like the more vertical, bureaucratic, hierarchical uh, firm structure and are organized more 
cooperatively with more egalitarian principles. Um, and so I was always sort of seeking that out. And when I attended UCSD, I was sort of looking for, you know, other sort of left-wing groups, other sort of um, people interested in these kinds of politics. And I was very fortunate to find that although at the time UCSD didn't really have any active left-wing groups, it did have a fully functioning sort of network of um, worker cooperatives. So, um, you know, I was always interested in like political theory books that, you know, that sort of thing. So um, yeah, I um, checked out Garden Books Collective. I met some of the previous members who are who've graduated by now. Um, the whole place seemed wonderful. Um, you know, it's, it's just this bookstore, people just talking about politics while, um, you know, so the, basically the things that I'd always been interested in, but could never, could never really find other people to discuss with. But um, yes, having this bookstore um, on campus was, you know, very eye-opening. Um, the, the structure also was quite interesting how you, I would just go in and, um, you know, no one was really particularly like bossing me around or doing anything. Uh, obviously people had to teach me various store functions, but, um, no, yeah, that was just, uh, I guess that's how I became involved with the uh, Garment Books Collective. And, um, what's the political atmosphere like on campus? Uh, um so that's changed um that's that that's an interesting question so when i got to ucsd and i think it was fall 2018 um there had sort of been so historically the the common joke or um yeah i guess cynical joke around the more political politically active people on campus that ucsd is um you know, especially among, you know, the other University of California schools, very kind of politically inert for a time. I know, especially um, like the mid 2010s, there was, uh, there were various um, student, um, I guess, movements on campus, like related to racial justice, um, related to like this incident called the Compton Cookout. Um, but aside from, I mean, that was a really big event, but like, between then, I think around 2016, it was a little bit politically dead. Um, and then there was this massive explosion in 2016 with the election of Donald Trump, where, um, you know, this was sort of this, for many students on campus, this was kind of this unprecedented event. Um, many of them for spontaneously, sorry, what was that? For us all. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, it was quite shocking. Um, but yes. Um, on the election night of Donald Trump, that was in yeah, no, uh, 2016, um, many students, like thousands and thousands of students in this campus that had, you know, until very recently been kind of politically inert, um, thousands of students just like spontaneously protest, like took to the streets essentially and started protesting the, you know, um, victory of Donald Trump. Uh, many of them marched through, like thousands of students were marching through campus. It was like very crowded um, from what I've heard. They, I think they, um, marched to like the highway and then um, from there the police tried to disperse them. Um, but since that, from my understanding, that was like a big sort of catalyst from then on. Um, there were a series of different um, political groups that tried to um, become more active. So um, let me think. There was a, a I think an anti-fascist coalition that tried to get itself organized on campus. Um, not quite sure what happened to it, but um, it formed in response to number one, you know, the rising sort of right wing tensions on every university campus around 2017. So um, the, you know, white supremacist group Identity Europa had um, um, potentially, I'm still not 100% sure, but potentially they had members at UCSD and they were um, harassing various like ethnic studies classes or gender studies classes. Um, so an anti-fascist group formed in response to that. Um, when I arrived to campus, that was, I think it was kind of, that was sort of waning. Um, so like some of the things I got highly involved with in terms of political activism was a lot of the um, trade union struggles on campus. So there's, I believe six or seven trade unions on campus and two of them had been doing a series of contract negotiations with the university and um, 
that had been going nowhere. So a series of strikes ensued. Um, that was what I was heavily involved with. Um, I think the more recent, I guess, recently the campus does feel a little bit more, I guess, politically engaged than has in the past. Um, two really notable things have been the um, graduate student wildcat strikes that occurred, I believe, in winter 2020, or yeah, when, yeah, last year, 2020, um, across the UC campuses over um, cost of living adjustment disputes. And I know there's been a few, um, especially in the wake of the George Floyd shooting and the various other, um, you know, energies that have emerged in response to the, you know, series of police brutality cases from the, from last year's uh, May and June. Um, there's like, I know there's been some new abolitionist groups, um, sort of anti-police groups that have formed on campus. Um, so, so yeah, the campus uh, at one point, not very politically active and it's slowly been increasing throughout the years. So um, what, what's your program of study? Uh, what do you, what do you specialize in? So I'm a double major right now. I'm studying political science, emphasis in political theory um, and sociocultural anthropology. And I'm also minoring in philosophy. Cool. And you know, are there you know, particular topics or, or authors that interest you in those areas? So for political theory, um, I'd say 100% like Pierre Joseph Proudhon is a big influence. Um, I'm still, uh, I like read quite a number of Marxists, but um, I'm not sure if I would ever put that label on myself per se. Um, let me think. Um, I usually, whenever people ask this question, I always say like um, Kevin Carson actually is quite influential on in my beliefs. Um, I've been reading him for, you know, years now. Um, he's, I, I interviewed him uh, on a series a while ago and, and we, we work together and stuff. So I've yes, never, I'm familiar with um, I've never the Center actually, for a Stateless Society, yes. I've never actually met him in person, but I, and I, for a while there was this, you know, if there, were, there was this theory that he didn't really exist, that um, oh, okay. a, uh, a character that we had invented, uh, <laughs> uh, the way that uh, some people, um, some people thought that Wittgenstein was a character that the Vienna Circle had invented. Oh. Okay. Him. And when they first encountered him in the flesh, they were like, what? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, yeah, I, I think I listened to your interview with Carson. Um, no, yeah, I always try to like find interviews with him. They seem to be very few and far between. Um, but yeah, Carson's a big influence. Um, let me probably like uh, some of the writings of Michel Foucault I find interesting, David Graeber. Um, James C. Scott, those are two, you know, anthropologists. Um, yeah, I guess that would be a brief summary of the political theorists and anthropologists I find interesting. Uh, yeah, I've been, uh, you know, I had, um, I've had online interactions with both Scott and Graeber. In fact, I, I had planned to invite Graeber to interview, but, but obviously oh. that happened. Yes, uh, yes, that was very unfortunate. That was uh, sort of a shocking out of nowhere. Uh, uh, and um, I know uh, I know Sean Wilbur has done a lot of translating of Proudhon. Um, oh, oh yes, Sean Wilbur. Yes, that's who I was forgetting. Sean Wilbur. I've been reading him for the past year or two or so. His writings are pretty. I, I'm really enjoying them as well. Yeah, I know he's he's really trying to wrestle with the complexity of Proudhon because you know there are all these sort of superficial takes on Proudhon and. But you know, as soon as you look more closely, that dissolves and something else more complicated. And um, that's when anyone ever asks me, you know, to summarize you know, what's the short version of Proudhon? I say, well, there, there isn't one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Really, uh, you know, he's got these various types of concerns, but um, you know, trying to pigeonhole into a particular category. Uh, you know, various people who are influenced by him adopted some more simplified and stylized version of them, which you can sort of hardly blame them because it's hard to know what it means to be a Proudhonian if you're really digging into the actual text, but that, that's what Sean's trying to do. Um, yeah, yeah. No, it's it's great to see that he's like really diving deep into this sort of um, 
just very like overlooked sort of complex like political philosophy that it existed at one point. Yeah, and um, you know, as is often the case with you know, with various figures, you know, they their names are remembered, uh, but people don't actually read them, or they'll read just you know, just a hand, you know, just a, you know, a couple of, of texts or a couple of uh, excerpts. Um, you know, so uh, you know, Proudhon is famous for like a few one-liners. Um, people remember the one-liners. You can't really reconstruct a philosopher from the one-liners. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so you know, have you thought about your plans after? Um, uh, well, obviously, you've thought about them. But I mean, you know, do you have plans after? You know, a after uh, uh, college, you know, which of those various directions you might go in, or what you might be doing? Um, I guess right now I'm really looking into anthropology PhD programs. Mm -hmm. um, um, on the topic of Wilbur and Proudhon, actually, I know Wilbur's um, big project is sort of reconstructing a Proudhonian social science and, um, you know, in, this, in a similar vein as Marx, but for, I guess, a purely anarchist philosophy. And then, um, you know, I know he's mentioned like, oh, it would be great if people could try to actually apply once Proudhon social science has been sort of, I guess, excavated, um, actually applying it to social scientific endeavors in the same way Marxism is. Um, so I thought it would be, I kind of, I've been thinking about like attempting to do just that sort of um, taking some of Proudhon's theories and actually applying it within a modern social scientific context. Um, I've read plenty of Marxist anthropologists, sociologists, political scientists, etc. cetera. Um, you know, having a Proudhonian and then by extension, a more anarchist lens to this sort of thing might be, um, I think it could be very useful for, you know, um, understanding the world, I guess. Um, that's sort of what I've been thinking of, I guess. Well, um, I think I should probably go into depth about the actual organization of Grand Books. Um, I haven't covered that yet so far. So, um, when I joined Ground Books Collective, um, you know, again, there was no sort of strict hierarchies. There were no, you know, no, no bosses near bureaucracy, that sort of thing. Um, and I had to sort of get used to this very unique way of sort of organizing this, this enterprise, this, this bookstore. Um, so the way the collective works is um, a big component of our sort of like, I guess, governance would be um, we have like meetings every, uh, when we were in person and during, you know, in operating hours, we would have them like weekly or so. Um, and the way that usually worked was the um, collective would come together, all of us, or I guess whoever was available. Um, for that time, for that time being, uh, the collective would come together every like once a week for this like sort of meeting, and at the meeting we would do this thing called um, what is it? The meeting would be done in the what's it called? Like a stack structure. So various, uh, I guess it comes from the Occupy movement. Um, they have various sort of like hand gesture structures about like who's you know speaking order that sort of thing. Um, and then usually at the meetings, we'll have a variety of agenda topics um, that we need to discuss. So um, probably a good example would be this interview um, at our last meeting. We had to discuss, um, you know, oh, do we want to do this interview? Um, is it worth it? Who's going to do it? That sort of thing. Who's going to take do the work of organizing it and actually going to the interview? That sort of thing. Um, um, and yeah, that's how we, that's like the first sort of part component of our I guess, governing structure. Um, and the next thing about like, you know, so at our store, we don't have any, there's no like job title, right? There's no like manager, there's no clerk, that sort of thing. Everyone is just a, um, at the store, you're either a member of the collective, which means that you're um, like an actual serious, dedicated, like you've sort of committed to helping the collective and that you have a responsibility to um, helping the collective and then there's like volunteers who are more um you know they've um they're interested in the bookstore they come they help out with 
you know, they might come to meetings sometimes or, um, you know, they, I guess they're sort of not under no like strict obligation to help out at the bookstore. Um, so in terms of like division of labor, uh, what we have is this, uh, is this thing called the residual responsibility and RR as we call it for short. Um, and basically that, that's at, at every meeting there'll be, you know, um, certain things that need, be, need to be done. So someone will have to order new books. Someone will uh, maybe have to reach out to another student organization, another activist group that we're cooperating with, that sort of thing, um, organizing events. Um, and then the person with the RR, which will usually be someone who volunteers to do it. Um, it was like a really important thing, like, um, you know, compiling sales sheets or whatever for taxes that might have to actually be, you know, someone will maybe have to be assigned that duty. But um, for the most part, um, all RRs are, you know, taken up on a voluntary basis. And then um, the person who takes on that residual responsibility, it is their sort of task to complete that um, within the sort of designated time, well, within a timely manner. Um, if it's a time sensitive RR, like, oh, you have to go meet with this group next week, then obviously their job is to meet with that group at, you know, that week. If it's something like, um, oh, um, someone has taken RR to restock on books, um, especially now that might not be, you know, too time sensitive at the moment, um, but, you know, other points of the year might be more time sensitive. Um, so going back to my example earlier, um, when we had our most recent meeting, um, you know, I brought up the, this interview with you and um, discussed it with the collective, brought up, you know, oh, this is Roderick Long. Um, you know, I'm familiar with his work. Um, I think the interview would be fine for Brown Books to go to, you know, have. Um, and then I volunteered to take an RR to actually organize the interview and, you know, attend it. And yeah, that, that for the most part probably describes uh, a good chunk of how the collective functions. And then for more sort of, you know, not everything we do has to go through um, a meeting. Um, oh, actually, before I get to that, I forgot. Um, so the collective as part of our horizontal sort of egalitarian, egalitarian governance, um, you know, all major decisions have to go through the same do a consensus process of um, essentially all members of the collective. So, you know, not volunteers, because again, they're not, um, they don't have any strict responsibilities to the collective, but all members of the collective have to consent to um, certain decisions we take at meetings. So for instance, if we want to support um, a political group, um, you know, we have to have, those usually will have fairly strong debates or unless we're all on the same page, but like, Let's say, you know, oh, we want to support this trade union, we'll discuss it, we'll, and then we'll ask for consensus and all members have to consent to, you know, supporting this group, otherwise the collective as a whole will not um, do so. Um, but yeah, and then the way consensus could break down, I guess, would be um, if one member of the collective, you know, it could be you know, 10 people agree that we should do this one thing, but if one member um, of the collective um, disagrees, if they block any sort of proposal, then the whole thing is, um, you know, it doesn't go through essentially. Um, that instance is fairly, is extremely rare. I've worked at the bookstore for about um, coming up on three years now. I think I've only, I can only recall maybe like two or three times, like, a member of the collective has ever blocked, um, you know, any sort of action we were, the whole bookstore was planning on doing. Um, but for, yeah, for the most part, we have um, consensus is pretty, once we've had a strong discussion, consensus occurs. Um, so that's the sort of more complicated side of running the bookstore. Um, the, I guess the easier part would be, you know, um, well, we are a bookstore, right? So someone has to sit at the counter and, you know, make sales, help help customers. Um, that sort of thing isn't like designated to anybody. It's mostly like, oh, you come to the bookstore, someone teaches you how to do, 
generally how to sort of do everything, make the sales, sort of um, inf basic information to tell customers, like, you know, how to open and close the bookstore. Um, that sort of general knowledge, everybody has that. And so, um, you know, everybody just sort of does it. Nobody has to be told to do it. They just sort of, that's sort of the expectation of what happens when you volunteer at a bookstore, basically. Um, and yeah, so that, I guess, gives a very brief overview of um, the internal workings of the collective. Has the bookstore encountered any hostility on campus? Because political organizations of whatever type usually get some kind of pushback from somebody. Yes. Um, so there's, I guess, broadly two groups that we will have, we've had conflicts with in the past. Um, number one is, I guess, you know, general right wing organizations. Um, that has, to my knowledge, that has not had, we've not had any explicit open confrontation with the right wing groups that exist on campus. Um, I know the year in the past few years before I showed up to the bookstore, um, I think there were two notable events. One was, um, let me think. So I guess one, uh, one of them was not, uh, none of this information is confirmed, so I can't uh, explicitly say that something like this is what happened. But basically at one point, um, we were the victim of an arson attack. So, um, what is it? A um, one of our we have like book carts that are on the outside of the store, and one of them was set on fire. And then um, that just completely burned down. And then I think on that same night, or uh, my, my you know what I've been told of the event that's a little hazy. Um, someone broke into the store, broke the windows, um, attempted to push over a lot of these shelves over here, um, poured gasoline on the floor and attempted to light the bookstore on fire. Um, uh, the bookstore is still standing um, and all these, everything you see behind me there, it's still all there. So um, an arsonist was very, um, incredibly incompetent to fail at burning down a bookstore. With, <laughs> you know, everything in there is either wood or paper. Yeah. I know. I mean, everything in here is very, I mean, I don't know. I, I guess I, I'm still not sure how that happened. I've seen photos like people, there was a, a strong attempt to, you know, burn down the entire store, but um, yeah, they failed or something happened. Um, Thank the gods for incompetent en enemies. Yes, yes, very much so. So um, for that incident, we suspect it was right wing groups. Well, again, we can't confirm that for sure, but um, we are a, I mean, we're a explicitly left wing, you know, bookstore on campus. Um, so I would be surprised if it was just a, and also not, I think it was the, the reason we think it was politically motivated was because um, I think like nothing was stolen or like no, you know, it wasn't just a robbery, like it was a, uh, uh, meant to damage the store, not like, you know, seize anything. Um, so that hints to sort of political motivations. And then the other antagonism we have on campus, and this has happened for probably a good chunk of our history has been with the actual UCSD administration. So, um, you know, historically, um, the administration has had Quite a number of like right-leaning or neoliberal very essentially people would be very hostile to having a bookstore on campus disseminate left-wing ideas and especially a, some and um i guess in more recent years um as the university has attempted to bring in more like normal businesses that i guess some college campuses have like fast food restaurants or you know that sort of thing businesses that are able to potentially earn the university money or something of that sort. Um, having us take up an entire chunk of university real estate is also, um, you know, not conducive for their, I guess, profit-making um, goals. So for, in that regard, um, our bookstore, as well as the three other worker cooperatives on campus have had um, a myriad of hostility from the administration 
Um, at the moment, it's, I would say, kind of cordial, but I know in the past, um, this was an art bookstore, but another um, student worker cooperative on campus, the Che Cafe, um, the university sort of put up this like bogus excuse for trying to bulldoze the entire establishment, get it off campus. Um, um, this, there was a lot of back and forth between this, but eventually the university um, conceded that like, there was no just reasons to, you know, um, condemning and destroying this um, cooperative center on campus. And so they um, signed a new lease with them as well as all the other um, work cooperatives on campus. Um, but yeah, um, in terms of right wing organizing on campus, that's a little, um, I'm a little murky on that. I'm not, I know there are right wing elements on campus. I can't say to what extent they're organized and to what extent they have, um, I guess, attacked us in recent years. But for the most part, whenever Grunt Books Collective is engaging with another group, it will in some way or another be, have to do with the UCSD administration. So most of the customers who drop into your store, are they people who know what your store is and they're looking for, for it? Or are, they, you know, are, are more of them just people sort of randomly dropping in, not knowing what to expect or somewhere in between? Um, so UCSD is, uh, it's an open campus. So, you know, there's lots of visitors every single day. And occasionally one of those visitors will come by our area of the school, the student center and, um, you know, pass by our bookstore. They'll see, um, you know, from the outside, we have like a hanging window saying like our books and that might catch their attention. They'll maybe explore inside. Um, that's one group, another, obviously big group are the students on campus, you know, various faculty, grad students, undergrads. Um, a lot of them are, uh, actually, because of the size of the student body and the size of the campus, um, I think every year we meet, you know, dozens, hundreds of people who are like, oh, I've been at UCSD for, a, you know, so-and-so years, months, weeks, and I didn't know this place existed and we discovered for the first time um, but, uh, you know, everyone always leaves saying, oh, I'm glad this place is here. This place is cool. Um, so um, occasionally there will be, you know, some people who um, either from the San Diego area or they're visiting UCSD or something where um, they are familiar with Grand Books Collective and they'll um, explicitly sort of visit the bookstore, you know, knowing what it is. I can't, um, I, yeah, I can't say that happens from my memory, not as often as the, you know, wandering, I guess, tourists or students coming in, but um, that, yeah, that'll happen occasionally. And uh, uh, yeah. I can imagine one potential source of hostility is that San Diego is a big military town, obviously. And uh, some of the stuff you carry might be you know, a bit at odds with that. Yes, um, actually, I think we have, I think the members of the collective have discussed this before. Um, you ever get people asking for like a military discount? No, uh, well, no, actually, but um, actually, yeah, I don't recall too many veterans or active military members ever visiting the store. And if they have, and maybe, maybe they're, they have, but um, what is it? Nobody has, uh, I mean, I've never heard of any, uh, there might've been, maybe one incident, but I really can't recall any specific incidences of uh, hostility from the military. Um, I know, oddly enough, um, you know, we've discussed this before, like there's been incidences where, um, oh geez, what was it? I think some like, some affluent conservative white parent walked into the store one day and asked like, uh, what are the store's political beliefs? And then they walk, so they walked in from the front of the store and they, they like basically walked past a giant like hammer and sickle and a bunch of like anarchist like symbols. And they asked us like, so what are the source political beliefs? And we just pointed at like right behind them, like there's a giant hammer and sickle there. Is that enough for you? And they're like, uh, okay, anyways, uh, so what do you guys do here? And 
they just, I don't know why, they just seem, seem to completely, I don't know, ignore it. I don't know. So we've, um, yes, we've discussed to what extent, like, you know, oh, are we, I guess, internal arguments, oh, are we left-wing enough? Are we, you know, um, sometimes we get pushback, but sometimes we get, we would expect to get pushback from certain groups, but sometimes we don't. And sometimes we'll be like, is that good? Is that bad? You know, um, so that sort of thing happens, but uh, yeah, I can't recall any direct, I can't recall any major um, political confrontations occurring within the, within the yeah, store, something like that. Um, what kind of political disagreements do you have sort of within the store? So I can imagine that some people might identify more with the hammer and sickle and other people might identify more with the, the anarchy symbol and those symbols haven't always gotten along happily. Yes, yes, no, for sure. Um, from my understanding, um, either various different political groups will come in and out of the store. So I've heard like at some point in the past, there was a more Marxist leaning at some point, more um, sort of new left Maoist, other anarchists. Um, I know right now our current cohort, um, we're, we're really, really, really all over the place. Um, obviously I mentioned um, Proudhon, the schools of like, I guess, mutualism, that's what I'm interested in. We have other sort of the more uh, classical, modern social anarchists of like uh, people interested in Kropotkin, Goldman, um, that sort of thing that's at the store. Um, we did have uh, like the last two years, um, there was like a Maoist at the store. There was a person who was a um, so sort of self-described left communist of like the strict ultra left Bordiga, um, you know, sort of strict kind of Marxism, um, other people. Uh, we, we do actually every year get people who are still sort of uh, having, you know, questioning their political beliefs, that sort of thing. So they come in not having, you know, uh, complicated or strict political theories and then they sort of learn from other members or from the books we have. Um, so, so that's sort of, so yeah, we're like all over the place. I mean, um, any sort of left-wing group you can imagine, I'm sure we've had at our store at one point. Um, and yeah, that's definitely something we have to um, contend with sort of, you know, how do we, as these disparate, very, you know, disparate ideologies, disparate group of beliefs, how do we, you know, do we cooperate? To what extent do we cooperate? You know, like, uh, um, you know, we've had some very, I guess for more, you know, serious issues, like for instance, the undergrad, uh, the graduate wildcat strike, that was very, you know, regardless of our differences, everyone was like, yes, obviously we're gonna support this. We have, we had full consensus to support and do lots of active work supporting the wildcat strike to any capacity we could. Um, the political group disagreements might flare up at more petty things. So you've mentioned the hammer and sickle and, you know, anarchist, uh, you know, obviously they, the, historically they never mesh. Um, we've argued like, oh, to what extent do we need um, certain symbols in the store? Do we need more pictures of Mao Zedong on the wall? Do we need more pictures of Stalin? Do we not, should we have less Zapatista stuff on the, stuff like that? Um, you know, that's, those arguments have occurred. Um, and I know before, from my, uh, from what I've been told from previous members of the store, um, you know, there was also other anarchist Marxist split and um, those arguments did um, sort of have disagreements over organization, like, okay, the store is supposed to be you know, non-hierarchical, horizontal, um, is it, you know, is that producing what we want for the store in, in how we're doing those ideals? Does it need to be restructured along more Marxist lines or, um, you know, is the store an organized in an anarchist way and is that good or bad? Um, is it a Marx, is it less or more Marxist? Is this good or bad? Um, these debates certainly do happen as within any sort of left-wing circles, um, but um, I'd say for the most part, when it comes to, again, major political issues, um, 
you know, racial justice, um, anti-imperialism, anti-militarism, social justice. Um, you know, everyone can, you know, no one's ever disagreed on any of those issues. Um, more minute things that might later down the line produce substance, uh, bigger issues. Um, those debates have occurred, but, um, but yeah, I mean, no, I mean, no one's at eat. You know, obviously, I've argued with people of different ideologies, but I'm never like, oh, I'm never going to talk to you again, never going to work with you again, um, over, over something that's like theoretical. Um, so, so yeah. Yeah, and you know, from my experience, there, there doesn't seem to be any particular correlation between you know, how big or small the point of disagreement is, and the extent to which people take it as a reason never to talk to you again. You know, yeah. Sometimes they'll there'll be some you know really massive theoretical disagreement where people have it work together over it. And sometimes it will be some very minor point of minutia, but that will be for some people the you know, the absolute sticking point and, and uh, you know sorry if you're you know, if you're going that way then you know I forgot to got to fight you. Um, you know so it's almost you know it's uh you know it's hard to predict sometimes what people will what big fights over and what they won't. Um, you know, I mean, so C4SS is, um, you know, it's organized kind of more or less along consensus lines, but kind of informally. Uh, you know, since we don't meet in person, we meet online, and not all of us keep up with the mail list at any given uh, at any given time. <clears throat> so, try to do things by consensus, but you know, if someone just doesn't show up and. Uh, and, uh, and I haven't been showing up lately because I've been sort of swamped with work. Uh, so who knows what they, who knows what they've decided about me over the last month, right? Uh, but um, uh, you know, you know, usually when we get consensus, sometimes when we can't get consensus, we have to resort to you know, do a majority vote. And that, we just regard that as a failure. Um, but sometimes it's you know it's uh, obviously simple straightforward and often at least there's there's a consensus on deciding it by majority vote at least so it's like a uh, you know but of course we've had our um we've had our share of uh you know, irreconcilable splits too right so people who left or in some cases been pushed out for but usually not you know people who pushed out usually not just for most in most cases not just for ideological reasons but for something worse <laughs> right right um but um but yeah, so uh, you know we you know, we've got I can't even remember what the title is now a um, a uh, you know uh, while the title was coordinating director uh, I can't remember if that's still the title we use or not um, but it's uh, it's a position that's sort of all responsibility and, and close to zero authority um, and it's just sort of you know nagging people to do something so that something can happen right but you know for the most part you know you know we've had our squabbles but uh um you know and some some of us have sort of more combative modes of interaction than others of us but for the most part we uh you know, we uh get along fine of course we um you know our our resources are pretty limited so you know, the, the range of, of things over which we need to make decisions is fairly narrow, although that can, you know, uh, you know, that can still you know, engage a, a lot of attention sometimes. Um, yeah, yeah. Hey, well, I'm not sure I have any more questions for you. At the moment, I'll, you know, once we stop, I'll probably think of some. Uh, right. That's how these old things always work, but um, it's been really interesting. I wish you the uh, best of luck uh, for the uh, for the store and and for your own personal uh, career. Um, say hi to the other members uh, for me. Uh, any any last thoughts? Um, yes. Yeah, so I do believe um, you know whether there's some sort of restriction or not. Ground Books Collective will well, at the moment we're closed for the summer. We will be open in the fall. Um, um, our hours will probably be posted on our Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or all three. 
So if you want to know more about Ground Books Collective, you can check it out on, again, our Facebook, our Twitter, on our Instagram. Yeah, I know there's a yes. some of place I saw you are off our website, but the website seemed to go nowhere. Um, right. Yes, we need to. Um, we I think we just redid our website, so we might have to mess around with the hyperlinks again. Um, yes, I can send you a link to our our actual functioning URL after this. Also, if if there are any photos that you uh, like me to use in this in this video, you can. You know, send me a link to which ones you want me to use, or I could just grab them off your, off the Facebook page or whatever, if that's all right. But um, uh, if there are any particular photos you'd like me to intersperse here and there in the interview, you can, uh, let me know that. Okay, yeah, for sure. I'll, um, yeah, I'll, I'll try to send you anything that is noteworthy. Okay. Thanks a lot. All right. Thank you very much for this interview. Yeah, thank you. All right. Goodbye. Bye-bye.